the Lord has said among the remnant who the Lord calls. Hallelujah. If you was here last week, that was our uh, foundational scripture. And we have started a study. The Lord has led us into a study on the Holy Ghost. We've been talking about the Holy Ghost. We in week two now talking about the Holy Ghost. I can't get away from it. I want to go deeper. I want to learn more about this piece of the Trinity. This part of the Trinity who call, whose name is Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost. I want to know more about Him. And if you were here last week, then you, you know what I'm talking about. But we learned last week that when you begin to talk about the Holy Ghost, He begins to manifest Himself in the house. And I, I got up here and I didn't really know how it was going to go. I said, my goodness, these folks are Pentecostal. What I got to tell them about the Holy Ghost for? They know who He is. They know how He operates. But the more I began to preach on the Holy Ghost and the more I got to talking about Holy Spirit, He began to show Himself more and more and more in the house. And we just broke out in revival because He wants to show Himself real. How many of you know that Holy Spirit, and we learned uh, last week, Holy Spirit is not an it. But he, he's a he. He's a being. He has emotions and he has characteristics just like us people do. He can be grieved. He can be hurt. He can be sad. He can be happy. He can be joyful. And, and how many of you know that we can grieve him and we can make him upset. But sometimes we do things that makes him happy and makes him joyful when we obey it makes Him happy. It makes Him joyful to see us move within obedience and without hesitation. We learned last week that Holy Spirit is not just a part of the Trinity, but He is a co-equal of the Trinity. Which means this. If I say God the Father, and you're okay with that, and I say God the Son, and you're okay with that. But I say God the Holy Ghost, and that makes you feel a little uncomfortable. We have an issue. Because see, once I say that, and it makes you uncomfortable, that means you're not looking at Holy Spirit as a co-equal of the Trinity. Yet He is. And we learned last week that God the Father created, and He sat down and He rested. And He said that His work was complete. And then Jesus came to, uh, came to earth died on a cross, resurrected, ascended into heaven, and sat down and said, My work is complete. And then we see where Holy Spirit descended from heaven onto the church, but He has yet to announce His work is complete. That means Holy Spirit is still working. He is still operating in the body of Christ. Amen? Do you believe that? If you believe that, give Holy Spirit a hand clap of praise. Because let me tell you something. If it wasn't for the Holy Ghost, I'd have quit a long time ago. If it wasn't for the Holy Spirit, you wouldn't be here tonight. Because it is the Spirit of God that draws every man to salvation. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Tonight I want to take that discussion a little bit deeper. And um, I'm already a week ahead. The Lord has led me past this in my study. We're going to get as far as we can, but if we don't get to it, come back tomorrow, uh, next week, and as long as God don't change His mind, we're going to be talking about tongues. Amen? Amen. We're going to talk about tongues. I think it's time for the, for the church to know what they're doing. Amen? Amen. 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 First Peter. Chapter 1. Say, why did you go to Joel 2? Joel 2, that's going to be our foundational scripture. First Peter. I give you a minute. That's a hard one to find for some of us. Unless you got your holy iPhone, it's three clicks away. Yeah. 1 Peter, and I'm going to read the first two verses. This is kind of where we left off last Wednesday. 1 Peter chapter 1, and verse 1, this is what it says. It says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the 
dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace be multiplied. Last week we talked about who Holy Spirit was. Tonight I want to talk about what He does. Okay? First Peter, he gives us one of the one of the um, characteristics of, of the Holy Ghost in this characteristic. He's in this characteristic in this verse, he says the Holy Spirit sanctifies us. He is a sanctifier. Okay? He he's the one that takes us through the process of sanctification. Sanctification is something that is no longer talked about, Brother Jackie. We don't talk about sanctification no more. We don't talk about being sanctified. We don't talk about being holy. We don't talk about being acceptable unto God. We don't talk about that thing in the church anymore. And the reason is, is because when you start talking about sanctification and what that is and what that process does when you begin to go through it, you realize that you're not the perfect being that your mama made you out to be. Amen. We, we, we come to find out and we come to realize I've got some evil inside of me. I've got some mess inside of me that can't stay there if the Holy Ghost is going to dwell inside of me. And that makes us uncomfortable. And that makes us feel things like guilt. And we don't like guilt. It makes us feel convicted. And we don't like conviction. It makes us feel judged. And we don't like judgment. So what do we do? We say, Holy Spirit, we want you to baptize us. And we want you to make us speak in tongues. And we want you to operate through us and let us heal people. And we want you to operate through us and let us give words of wisdom. And words of knowledge. And I want to be empowered. But I don't want to be sanctified. And here's the thing. If you're going to have Holy Spirit in your life, He don't just empower you. He sanctifies you. Sanctification right here. The Greek word is hagismos. Hagismos. However you say it. I don't know how to say it. But this is what it means. It means He is a purifier. He purifies me, um, my wife just got us to sit through a rainbow vacuum cleaner demonstration. <laughs> they tried to convince me and almost succeeded. I ain't going to lie to you. When they showed me how nasty my carpet was. That I needed to spend $4,000 on a vacuum cleaner. I said, oh... I felt like that king in the New Testament that told Paul, I was almost persuaded. <laughs> but when I seen how much it was going to cost, but why did she do it? She knew, We went into this thing. We both told each other, we ain't buying no vacuum. We ain't doing it. What we were doing is we were sitting through this demonstration so that we could get a free rain mate. What is the rain mate? The rain mate is an air purifier. That's what it does. It cleans the air. And what happens is you take this bowl that the, that the rain mate sits on and you fill this bowl up with water. And what it does is it begins to suck all the air in. And it traps all the dust and bacteria and dead skin and all those things in the water and it blows cool air back out. Listen to me. Listen to what I'm saying. And what is it? What is this rain mate? It is a purifier. I find it very odd that this water works better than a dry filter. She showed us how our vacuum cleaner, when you take it and you run it across the ground, that it's more, it's really just pushing the dirt deeper into the carpet and it's not actually picking up anything because we have a dry filter. Listen to me. And when a dry filter gets clogged, it can no longer filter the dust. Therefore, you've got suction, but ain't nothing really getting clean. But you see, this rainbow vacuum cleaner doesn't have a dry filter. 
It has a water. I'm not trying to sell you a rainbow. Don't get uncomfortable. But <laughs> this rainbow vacuum cleaner doesn't have a dry filter. What it has is it has a bowl of water that filters all the dirt. So this water is what's trapping the dirt and not allowing it to go back out. What am I trying to say? This is what I'm trying to say. The Holy Spirit is symbolized as water. And we want the water in here. And we want the water of the Spirit flowing in our church and in our lives. But when it starts sucking in dirt and it starts sucking in mess and it says, I'm not letting this go. I'm not going to allow you to hang on to this dirt any longer. I'm going to trap it in me and I'm not going to let you operate that way. I'm not going to let you do the thing that you've always been doing. It makes us uncomfortable. We do not like to be purified. We like staying in the mess. We like, we like the way the dirt makes us feel. Let me be honest with you. You say, you say, not me. I don't like it. I don't like that mess. But see, here's the thing. What are you doing to get yourself out of it? What are you doing to get yourself out of the mess? Huh. I'm in debt. Quit spending. But I promise everybody that's in debt, come Sunday, I'm going to drive over there to San Marcos. I'm going to find you eating chips and salt. <laughs> And you'll justify it. You'll say things like this. I ain't got money for the lot bill anyway. Come on. Come on. Don't act like we're the only one. Me and Destiny ain't the only ones in here that said the lot bill's $200. All I got's $190. Can't pay it no way. Might as well go get some San Marcos. <laughs> Come on. Come on, somebody. What are we doing to change it? We say that we don't like the place that we're in, but we like the things that are around us. No drug addict likes living the life of a drug addict. They don't like what it does to them. They lose their jobs. They lose their families. They lose their children. They lose everything around them. Nobody likes living the life of an addict or an alcoholic. But see, here's the thing. They can't let go of what they're addicted to in order for everything around them to change. This thing has got them gripped. And how do I get fixed? AA meeting ain't going to fix you. Sorry. Therapy ain't going to fix you. Rehab don't work. Trust me, I know. It doesn't work. But I can tell you something that has a 100% success rate and his name is Holy Spirit. If you'll get the purifier in your life, he will suck out the dirt and not let it go. Come on, somebody. He's a purifier. Can I move on? Can I move on? Huh. John chapter 14. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and move fast, but don't worry. This is being videoed. Go on YouTube. Find this midweek and write down all the scriptures. John chapter 14. Huh. I ain't started preaching yet. This is a Bible study. John chapter 14. And I'm going to start with verse 15. Read a few verses and then we're going to skip to 26. John chapter 14 verse 15. This is what Jesus says. Jesus says, If you love me, keep my commandments. Stop right there. If you love me, keep my commandments. I have an issue. We love him, but we don't keep his commandments. Oh. Uh, now, now, Pastor Jay, I don't have a golden calf in my living room. Yeah, you do. It's called Netflix. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I don't have a golden calf in my living room. I don't have a golden calf that I have set up in my house that I bow down to, I, that I pray to. I still pray to Jesus. I still talk 
to him. He's the one I worship. But see, here's the thing. He said, thou shalt not have any gods before me. That means anything that you put before me, you have turned into your golden calf. You have turned it into a god. Because when, when the Holy Spirit came over you and told you to pray, and you said, I'm going to sleep for 15 more minutes, and didn't get up and pray, sleep has now came before God, and now you have broken one of the ten. This is, this is elementary. I'm being honest. This is elementary. I ain't went nowhere yet. But see, he says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And this is where Jesus was telling them one time. He said, they bless me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. We come to church and we bless them every Sunday. Jesus, I love you. I love you. I love you. And then as soon as that leaves our mouth, we forget about it and we go break commandments. But he said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Verse 16 says this, And I will pray the Father, and He will give you another helper, that He may abide with you forever. Who is this helper? Jesus says, The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it, is it, because it neither sees Him nor knows Him. But you know Him, for He dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Now watch this. I want to break down these few verses real quick. <coughs> Jesus said in John 14, and these few verses that we just read, this is what He says. He says, the world can't receive Him. Because they can't see Him and they don't know Him. But you know Him. For He dwells with you and will one day dwell in you. Now see, here's the thing. This is where our minds get a little confused. Because my understanding is Holy Spirit has yet to come to earth. He doesn't descend on the church until Acts chapter 2. And that's what we've always been taught. But how many of you know that the Spirit was in Jesus? Listen to me. Listen to me. He said He's got the Holy Ghost already. Holy Ghost is already living inside of Jesus. That's why He told the disciples, you have dwelled with Him. You've been around Him. You've seen what He's able to do. You know that He's able to heal the sick. You know that He's able to draw people in. You know what He's able to do. But one day, He's going to be inside you. And what you've been witnessing me do, you are going to turn around and begin to do it. Oh, come on. Say, prove it. Say, prove it to me. Okay, I'll prove it to you. In the book of Matthew chapter 3, when Jesus is being baptized, when He comes up out the water, what does the Bible say? And the Spirit led him into the wilderness. How did the Spirit lead him into the wilderness if it didn't already happen? You want another one? First message Jesus ever preaches in the temple. He opens up the scrolls of Isaiah and he says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Come on. Come on. He says, I've got him. I've got him. He reads that whole verse right there in Isaiah. And after he gets done reading, he says, this day, this scripture, right here, right now, this scripture has been fulfilled. I've got the spirit of the Lord living on the inside of me. And he has empowered me. And he has equipped me. And he is leading me. And he is guiding me. Therefore, I can preach this gospel to you. But one day, you're not going to dwell with Him. But He's going to dwell in you. You're going to receive what I've got. Come on, church. Don't leave me. Don't leave me. I'm going somewhere. John 14, oh, John 14 and 15. Who is the Holy Ghost? We learned that last week. What does He do? We learned in 1 Peter that He sanctifies us. He purifies us. Here in John chapter 14 and verses 15 through 18, He tells us that He don't just sanctify us, but He helps us. He says He is your helper. Now let me slow down. 
Because I need to explain to somebody what a helper is. Come here, Destiny. In Genesis, when God creates man, He instructs man to name everything. He names everything, yada, yada, yada. And then He looks at man and He says, He's seen that it is not good for man to be alone. And what does He do? He sends man. He says, I'm going to create a woman to be your helper. I'm sending man a helper. This is what we... This is what we do, men. Are you with me, men? We read that scripture and this is what we read. <laughs> it's not good for man to be alone. So he made you a fine dime. <laughs> Come on, are you with me? Are you with me? That's how, ain't that how we think? That's how we think. Because see, here's the thing. When we're out there dating, we ain't looking for help. <laughs> you know what we're looking for? <laughs> yeah. And so we say, oh yeah, you look good. You look good. And we take them by the hand and we date them. And they say, they say things like this. I need a new bag. I need a new jacket. I need some new shoes. I need a new car. I need a new house. I need this. I need that. And you don't get help. What you get is broke. Come on, listen to me. Don't leave me hanging. Don't leave me hanging. You get broke. Oh, oh, but she's fine. She looks good. But she ain't no helper. And then we get married. Come on, men. Come on, men. Stick with me. I'm going to get on the women in a minute. And we read it like this. It is not good for man to be alone. So he sent us a do it all of Watch this. Watch this. Are you ready? I'm going somewhere. I promise. Yeah, we got the game on. Got the game on. Watching this football. Watching Alabama win and Auburn lose. It's always a good Saturday. Come on. Hallelujah. Roll time. Hey, baby. Will you come in here and help me with the dishes? No. Yeah, in a minute. In a minute. In a minute. The game's on. I need you to do it. I need you to take care of that for me. Come on, somebody. And then we say things like, is supper done? Are the kids bathed? Are their diapers changed? When you putting them in bed? When you doing this? When you doing that? I'm ready for you to sit down and show me some attention. I'm ready for you to do this. I'm ready for you to do this. We don't want a helper. We want to do it all. And see, here's the thing, men. The Holy Spirit... Is not to be, it was not to be sent to be looked at as something fine. Listen to me. And it wasn't to be looked at as someone to do it all for us. But it was designed just like the woman to help us, to walk beside us. And see, here's the thing. When we find ourselves in a bad situation, we're saying, Holy Spirit, get me out of here. Holy Spirit, get me up out of here. Fix the situation. Change the problem. Change this. Change my environment. But see, here's the thing. The Holy Spirit is helping you, strengthening you, leading you, and guiding you, yet you're wanting Him to come in, swoop you off your feet, and walk you out of there. But that's not what He's designed to do. He's designed to help. Oh, I knew I, knew I wouldn't get many amens on that. Because we don't want to look at Holy Ghost like that. We want to look at Holy Ghost as someone that can come in and save the day like Superman while we pull out our iPhones and video whatever thing. Come on. He's a helper. You go sit down. I'm going to move to the next one. Maybe I'll get more amens on this one. John chapter 14. Let's skip to verse 25. These things I have spoken to you while being present with you. But the Helper, who is the Helper? The Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name. He will teach you all things. And bring to your remembrance 
all things that I said to you. How does Holy Spirit help? He teaches and He reminds. I should have left Destiny down here. Because <laughs> remember when I was over here and she said, you help me do the dishes. And I said, yeah, in a minute. Don't be mad when the helper comes back around and reminds you. Yes. Oh me. <laughs> Don't be mad when the Holy Spirit comes back around and reminds you what you ought to be doing. The things that you know to do right and are no longer doing. It's called the sin of omission. The helper reminds us. The helper teaches us. When you're reading your word and something flies off the page at you and you never seen it that way before, but all of a sudden you say, man, I need to start doing that. You know who just taught you that? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. He teaches us. When you're walking down the road and you see somebody you ain't seen in a long time and they've gained a hundred pounds, come on. And you go to pull out that phone and call somebody and tell them how much weight they've gained and you're reminded that gossip ain't right. Come on, listen to me. Do you hear what I'm saying? Who just reminded you? Holy Spirit. This is part of how He purifies. All of this works hand in hand. You cannot be helped if you're not willing to be reminded. And you can't be helped if you're not willing to be taught. See, here's the thing today in today's society nobody is teachable anymore can I just be honest with you oh man let me tell y'all something I about, I about had a fit at football practice last night Lane's out there and I'm watching and, and y'all y'all gotta know me I'm an active dad and I'm not talking about active like working out no I mean active, like I'm over there, I'm, I'm involved in this practice. I'm not a coach, but I like to pretend. <laughs> and I'm over there on this, on this, I mean, I'm right there, I'm right there next to the boys. <laughs> I'm standing right there next to them. And I'm listening, and the coach is trying to teach these guys something. Now keep in mind, they're six, but he's trying to teach them and he's telling them, last week we got killed. You know why we got killed? With nobody blocking. And about four or five of them that was in the game, not me, I was blocking. I was doing what I was supposed to do. I'm this, I'm that. Well, well that and then the very next play, some kid just blows through the line, gets back there, sacks the quarterback, and the guy, the coach goes over there and he says, whose man was this? How was he able to break through our line like that? It wasn't my fault. That that was so and so. And I just couldn't help but to think, my goodness, this sounds like church. <laughs> this, sir, I, I can be a coach. If I can pastor, I can coach. It's the same thing. You're asking how something bad happened, and all we can do is point a finger to somebody else. It wasn't my fault. Don't look at me. Don't correct me. Don't preach that message towards me. Don't speak that word towards me. It's not my fault. It's their fault. It's their fault the service was dead. It's their fault. It's their fault. It's their fault. Why are we like that? Because we're not teachable. We've got to be teachable. And if we're not able to be teachable, we can't be helped. Somebody comes into here and they need help or to, or to be delivered from something and we pray for them and we pray for them and we tell them what to do from this point forward not to find themselves back in the same place that they just left and they let it go in one ear and out the other and then when they fall they blame the church again that's not the church's fault that's your fault because you're not teachable <laughs> gotta be teachable got to be teachable. He goes on. And he says, he says this. He says, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. 
and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. Do you know who the helper is? He's a comforter. You got King James Version. Does it say comforter? It says comforter. Read that. But the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. The comforter. He's not just a helper, but he's a comforter. I'm reading New King James. That's why it read a little different. But listen right here. Comforter here is another Greek word. And it means an intercessor. You say you want to be comforted. And how the Holy Spirit comforts you is He intercedes for you. What is an intercessor? An intercessor is a person that stands in the gap through prayer for someone else. The Holy Spirit intercedes on our behalf. I need you to hold on to that piece of information. Because we may not get to it today. But we're coming back to it. How does He intercede through us? When ye know not what to pray. The Spirit makes intercession come on somebody for you for moanings and groanings that cannot be uttered what am I trying to say when I don't know what I, I feel the Holy Ghost when I don't know what's going on when I can't figure out why I'm depressed why I can't figure out why I'm stressed out and everything's falling around and I'm praying, God, I need your help. God, I need you to comfort me. I need you to encourage me. And then all of a sudden, oh, I begin to cry out. And I'm using groanings and moanings that cannot be uttered. I'm just crying. I'm just screaming. I'm just weeping. That ain't you. That's Holy Spirit interceding on your behalf. He's the comforter. Somebody shout, He's the comforter. He's the he intercedes for us and through us by moanings and groanings that cannot be uttered. When you lay down and all you can do is ugly face cry. And you're groaning and you're moaning and you don't know what's going on. What's going on is the Holy Ghost is making intercession on your behalf. There's something that I've never been able to understand, Brother Jackie, and it's this. When I'm in a real bad place, I can go and lock myself in my secret place. I can begin to groan and moan and cry and beg God and cry and cry and cry. But there's something about when I get done crying and I get up, I just feel better. I don't know why I feel better. I can't explain why I feel better. All I know is I'm encouraged. All I know is my faith has been increased. Why? Because it wasn't me praying in that room. I was being interceded for by somebody that's got more power than I got. I'm going to get into tongues next week. But Paul said this. Paul said, when you pray in tongues, you speak not unto men, but you speak unto God. For when you speak in other tongues, you speak mysteries. That means it's a mystery as to why I'm depressed. It's a mystery as to why I'm worrying. It's a mystery as to why everything's falling apart around me. It's a mystery, and I can't solve it. But I've got an intercessor. I've got a comforter named the Holy Ghost that makes intercession on my behalf. <laughs> First Corinthians chapter 12. Is this okay tonight? First Corinthians chapter 12. <coughs> Oh, yeah. Are you thankful? 
for the Holy Ghost. First Corinthians chapter 12, Paul writes to the church at Corinth and this is what he says. Now, right now, now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. Can I stop right there for just a second? I'm not, I'm not going to go off with this, but I've I got to get something off my chest. And a lot of places and a lot of churches, and I'm not, talking, I'm not pointing one out, I'm not talking about a specific building, a specific place, or a specific group of people. But I'm saying a lot of times what we have are the gifts, the spiritual gifts in operation without understanding. And Paul said concerning spiritual gifts, I do not want you to be ignorant. I don't want you to lack understanding on these gifts. I want you to understand them. And I want you not only to operate in them, but when you're operating in them, I want you to understand and have knowledge of what is going on. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles carried away to these dumb idols. However, you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diverse, diversities of activities, but it's the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. Did you hear that? Mm. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things. I want you to key in on this. Distributing to each one individually as He wills. What does He do? He is the gift distributor. He distributes the gifts. There's something that we've got to realize when it comes to spiritual gifts. When it comes to spiritual gifts, we need to understand that we can operate in that gift, and we can also operate in a position of that gift. Yeah. Who in here is a preacher? Everybody in the building better raise your hand. That's everybody. Everybody. Everybody's a preacher. For you're all called to do the work of an evangelist. We all preach. We just preach different, different ways. But every, what, every day that you live your life, it's just another sermon. You hear me? We're all preachers. But watch this. How many of you are called to pastor? <laughs> I'm so lonely. <laughs> I have no power. Where's Brother Jason when you need him? <laughs> me. But you see, every hand should have went up on the preacher... But not everybody's called to hold the position of a pastor. Not everybody is called to evangelism, but not everybody is called to hold the position of an evangelist. Raise your hand. Don't be ashamed. But raise your hand if you've ever given out a word of prophecy. If you've ever prophesied. Y'all better look up the definition of prophecy. <laughs> prophecy. Okay. How many of you hold the position of prophet? Huh? Wait a second now. Wait a second. Sister Tina, you said you prophesied. You're not a prophet? How is that? How is that? Let me tell you how that is. Because 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 11 tells us that the Spirit works all these things distributing to each one individual.
individually as he wills. That means I don't got to be a prophet to prophesy. If the Spirit wants me to prophesy, I'll prophesy. I don't have to have a healing ministry to lay hands on somebody and watch them be healed. If the gift is on me at that time, I will lay hands on you and you will not be the same. Because the Spirit comes upon me and it gives me that gift for a moment, for that specific time, even though I don't hold the position. Making sense? Making sense? So everything that prophesies is not a prophet. This is why Paul does not want us to be ignorant to the gifts. Because we've got more prophets in this world today then we've got people. <laughs> oh, come on, somebody. I could drop the mic right there. Everything that barks on YouTube is a prophet. <laughs> Why? Because part, because a part of that is they gave a prophetic word one time. And they automatically deemed themselves prophet. <laughs> they spoke one prophetic word and said, man, I'm the next Elijah. <laughs> Come on, am I telling the truth? It's dangerous to be ignorant of the gifts. Why am I teaching this to a church full of Pentecostal believers? If you didn't believe like we believed, you'd have never came back after your first visit. Why? Because we are Pentecostal. We don't just have, we're not just associated with Pentecost. We are Pentecost. Do you hear what I'm saying? I don't just say that we believe in shouting. We operate in the shout. I don't say that we just believe in worship. We operate in worship. I don't just believe in praying in tongues. I operate in praying in tongues. <laughs> Big difference. But why am I teaching this? Why am I preaching this? Why am I talking on this subject to a church full of people that supposedly believe that word? Because just because we believe in it does not mean that we have understanding of it. And we don't need to be ignorant of it because if we're ignorant of it, you can believe in fire. But everything that burns is not fire sent from God. Listen to me, church. The Bible talks about when they built the altar to place sacrifices on, how God had to supply that fire. Nobody lit a match. Nobody rubbed sticks together. Nobody had to strike stones against one another. He supplied the fire. The, all the priest had to do was sustain it. You sustain the fire. I supply the fire. But see, there comes a time in Scripture where the Bible says the altar was built, the sacrifice was ready, but there was no fire burning. Amen. So these two priests, they get a good idea. Seen a cool trick one time. You rub these two sticks together long enough. <laughs> Come on, I'm going somewhere. Watch this. We do it too, Aunt Donnie. Let me tell you how. I've been told you sang that song three times, back to back to back. I, I hear if they sing, I never shall forget the day. One more time. <laughs> we'll have fire in the house. We'll have fire in the house. Come on, y'all know what I'm talking about. Y'all know what I'm talking about. And you know what the Bible called that? He said, this is strange fire. This fire was not for me. And Pentecostal churches are rampant with strange fire. With people operating in gifts that are not of God. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to be the first preacher that some of you have ever heard say this. But everything that comes up here and says and spells Eddie three times fast. Y'all don't know what I'm talking about. Let me show you. E D D I E E D D I E E D D I E. Come on. Everything that comes up here and spells college backwards. E G E L L O C. Come on. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Everything that comes up here and ties a string of syllables together is not of God. It's not. Some of it is strange fire. But why is it not being dealt with? It's not being dealt with because we are ignorant to the gifts. Ah. Somebody stand.
stands up. They speak in tongues. Another one stands up, speaks 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 in tongues. You got five different people speaking in tongues. Then all of a sudden somebody comes out and interprets all five. No man. No sir. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says three verses and a course. Right? Right? You know what that means? Paul was given specific instructions by God on how to determine what is real and what is not. You can look for the signs. You've got this gift called discerning of spirits, but you've also got the Word of God that backs up that intuition-like feeling that you've got in your stomach. And if it don't look right, and it don't sound right, and you go to the Word of God and it ain't right, it needs to be dealt with. Well, we don't want to hurt nobody's feelings. I refuse to compromise the anointing for your feelings. That's hard to do. I'm loving. I preach hard, but I'm loving. Ask the people closest to me. You don't think I am? I'm loving. I hate correcting people. I don't even like correcting my own kids. But see, here's the thing. If I don't correct them, the Bible says that I hate them. The Bible says I don't care about them. And if I don't correct the church when it needs correction, the Bible says I don't care about them. That I'm willing to let a wolf come in and eat on my sheep. I'm not going to stand here and let a wolf come in and eat my sheep. If it cries like a duck and walks like a duck, it's probably... I can't be ignorant to the gifts. He's the gift giver. He's the gift giver. And he gives to those as he wills. Can I show you something? I'm going to use him because he knows, I know he don't care that I use him. KB. KB, you ever prayed in spirit? You ever prayed in tongues? No, nope, never has. Never has. But I've witnessed him give words of wisdom to people. I've watched him prophesy. I've watched him give words of knowledge. I've watched him operate in the gift of faith. I've watched him operate in the gift of healing and in the gift of miracles. I've watched him operate in the gifts. But he's never prayed in tongues. How? Because the Spirit gives as he wills. Oh, we have, a, we have an ignorance to that. We tend to believe that the Holy Spirit only gives gifts to those that have been baptized with evidence. But that's not what the Scripture says. He says He gives it as He wants to, as He wills. That means as He desires. And let me tell you something. If He wants to use KB, if He wants to use me, if He wants to use anybody in this building, He will use them and it does not matter if it lines up with your theology or not. Can I be honest with you? Because there's only one truth and it's His. He writes it. He makes the rule book for it. And He gets to do what He wants to do. There's a, there's a, we like to think that He is bound between these pages. Those pages bind us. They are our borders. Do you hear me? They're our borders. Genesis to Revelations, we have to line up with those. And if we don't line up with those, then we have the right to say it's real or it ain't real. But here's the thing about God. He wrote the book. Amen? This is the problem I get. I'm almost done. This is the problem I run into. With other beliefs, and we ain't got to name them, you know who I'm talking about. With other beliefs and other theologies out there that are out there today, they have no problem talking about Holy Spirit, the comforter. They will tell you that that's what He is. He's a comforter. He's a helper. 
He's a, he's a teacher. He's a reminder. We have no problem you believing that. But if you start talking about spiritual gifts, all of a sudden they can't agree with that. And they can't line up with that. But see, here's the thing. This is just how I am, guys. If I can't believe that, I can't believe any of it. If the Bible said he's a comforter, and I can believe that, and I have experienced him as the comforter, and he says he's a helper, and I've experienced him as the helper, and he says he's the teacher, and I've had him teach me, and he says he will remind me, and I've had him remind me. If the Bible says he will give gifts as he wills, I must believe that too. I cannot change what the Bible says just because I don't understand it. Agree. Agree. So when somebody comes to you and says, yeah, he's the comforter. Yeah, he's the helper. Yeah, he's this. Yeah, he's that. He'll sanctify you. He'll help you. He'll teach you. He'll remind you. But I don't know that he can give gifts anymore. If he can't give me a gift, he can't help me. He can't comfort me. He can't teach me. He can't remind me. I don't want a piece of the Holy Ghost. I want the whole thing. I'm almost done. Acts chapter 1. Is this okay? Y'all learning? Y'all learning? Come on. Acts chapter 1. I'm going to start with verse 4. And being assembled together with them, He commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. What promise? The promise that He was talking about in John 14. Which He said, You have heard from Me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Can I stop right there just for a minute? I want to break something down. I want us to really tune in. If you haven't heard anything else I've said tonight, tune in on this. He said, John baptized with water. What is water baptism? I need your help. What is it? What does it signify? Also known as, starts with an S, salvation. Water baptism symbolizes salvation. That's what it is. The dead man being buried with Christ, the new man being resurrected with Christ. Old things have passed away. All things, come on. He said, John baptized you with water. He baptized you in salvation. But you're going to be baptized in the Holy Ghost not many days from now. Wait a second. I thought when we got saved. <laughs> Don't I get it all, Sister T? You mean to tell me when I get saved and I ask the Lord to come into my heart, Holy Spirit don't come in with me? Come on. Yeah, that's what I'm looking for. What does baptized mean? Does anybody know? To be fully wet. That's what it means. <laughs> to be fully wet. Notice something right here. You have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water. But you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. He did not say you will receive the Holy Spirit. He said you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Do you know what that means? I'm going to be fully submerged in the Spirit. When did the Holy Spirit... I'm, I'm trying to get you to follow me. I really want you to learn this part. 
When did the Holy Spirit baptize the church for the first time? Acts 2. Acts 2. Fully baptized the church in Acts 2, right? When fire came down from heaven, sat upon each of them, they spake with cloven tongues as of fire. Right? But, so, Acts chapter 2, Jesus already ascended, correct? He's already gone. But after Jesus resurrected from the dead, before He ascended, walks into a room with the disciples, the Bible says He blows on them, and He says, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. So I can receive the Holy Ghost and have the Holy Ghost, but not be baptized in the Holy Ghost. I can have a portion of the Holy Ghost, but I can and also not be baptized in the Holy Ghost. Are you following me? This is why we have the other beliefs and theologies out there. That when you get saved, you receive the Holy Ghost. And that is it. That is finito. That is the finale. That is, it is in its final stage. That's where we get this belief. Because they got saved. They received the Spirit. They are saved. Do you hear me? They're saved. If you've got this belief that Baptists ain't going to heaven, you're going to be mistaken. You're going to be very sad when you get there. That these people that you turn your nose up to just because they don't believe in praying in the Spirit, you've got to share a mansion with them. <laughs> oh, how awkward will it be? That should have been a red hymnal. That should have been a red back right there. Oh, how awkward it will be when we see the Baptist in the air. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> but that's why they believe that. I've got a really good pastor friend. Pastors of church in Maplesville. He is a um independent Baptist. Independent Baptist. Independent Baptist. They believe in shouting. They believe in radical worship. They don't know where they stand on the Holy Ghost. And let me tell you why. This is his exact words. I won't preach for it, but I won't preach against it. Because I've never experienced it. And I do not understand it. But see, here's the thing. He's saved. He's received the Holy Spirit. He has yet to be baptized. Where we get these other beliefs is that they've never been baptized. Therefore, they do not believe it is real. Y'all following me? I can receive the Holy Spirit, but not be baptized in the Holy Spirit. But Jesus says, you've been saved. You've been baptized by water. But... Not many days from now, you're going to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. Alright? Watch this. Let's flip or, to verse 7. <coughs> and He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in His own authority. But you shall receive power. Mm. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be a witness to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. What does He do? He comforts us. I'm getting ready to close. He comforts us he teaches us. He reminds us. He helps us. He sanctifies us. He gives us gifts. And then Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, He empowers us. He empowers us. Uncle Larry, many years ago, taught a message that has stuck with me since he taught. You believe that? He taught on this power. This word power in the Greek, I don't even need that. This word power in the Greek, you remember what the word is? Dunamis. That's it. Come on. 
He taught on the dunamis power. I'll never forget that. Because he broke down what dunamis meant. Dunamis is where we get the word, our English word, dynamite. Dynamite. Come on. TNT. Come on. Watch me explode. Yeah. Dynamite. Dunamis. Dunamis, if you search that Greek word out, if you do Greek word study on dunamis, it is the natural power of God. It is His natural ability. Without anybody's help, without anybody say so, He holds all dunamis power. He holds a power that is like dynamite ready to explode at any given moment. That is why when He speaks, it sounds like thunder. That's why when He shows Himself, it's like an explosion of light and it will blind those that look at it. Because it's the dunamis power. Watch this. He said in Acts chapter 1, I mean, yeah, in Acts chapter 1, He said, the Holy Spirit is going to give you power. When you look up that word power, it is that dunamis power in the Greek. It is dunamis. Dynamite-like power. A power that is inside of you ready to explode. Ready to break out. See, here's the thing about dynamite. It only works if fire is put to it. Oh, we got a lot of churches out there that got the dunamis ex that got the dunamis in them, but they ain't got no fire about them. You've got the Holy Ghost, but you need something to light you on fire so that you can explode. I don't want to just have it, but I want to work and operate in it. I'm ready to blow the roof off this place. You hear me? I've sat here and I've tried to be good and I've tried to stay calm and collected so that I can teach you something, but now we're talking about power. How was I able to break the addictions off my life? It was the dunamis power. How was I able to escape depression? The dunamis power. Somebody that had dynamite on the inside of them got on fire, laid hands on me. I received dynamite. And everything that was attached to me had to explode off. Oh, walked into prayer Monday night. I was ready for them to start singing, go rest high on that mountain. I felt like I was in a funeral service. I ain't talking bad about nobody. I don't believe it was not one individual's fault. It was just the spirit that was in the house. The church was under attack. I walked in there excited about what God was about to do. And when I sat down in my seat, I felt like I was about to die. I felt like there was no hope. I felt like everything around me was falling apart. I was hopeless. I was depressed. I was stressed out. And everybody around me felt the same way. But there was a dunamis power inside of us. And when we began to begin to pray and we began to push, a fire from heaven fell down in the room. And all of a sudden, we felt breakthrough. What is it? What is it? What is it? It's the Holy Ghost. It's the Holy Ghost. Mm. I'm going to be honest with you. You can say I'm crazy, but Paul felt the same way. I don't feel like I've prayed until I've prayed in tongues. I'm just going to be honest with you. When I'm driving down the road and I'm praying to God, I pray with my understanding. And then I begin to pray in the Spirit. And I don't feel like I've prayed until I've reached that point. If I don't pray in the Spirit, I don't feel like I've accomplished anything. Why? Because I need something to explode. I 
need something to break off of me. I'm tired of feeling muzzled. I'm tired of feeling lame. I'm tired of feeling hopeless. I need something to explode on the inside of me. I need the Holy Ghost. I need the Holy Ghost. Somebody, if you believe it, shout, I need the Holy Ghost. I've got to have him. I've got to have him. I'm bound up. I don't find a way out. But if dynamite would go off in my life, every wall around me would have to come from that down. Do you? Oh! They walked around the walls of Jericho and they walked and they walked and they walked and the Bible said on the seventh day the seventh time around they began to blow the trumpets and they began to shout with a loud voice let me tell you what happened the dunamis power of God was in that shout the dunamis power of God was in that worship He empowers me. Oh, I can't believe that he'll comfort me. And I can't believe that he'll help me. If I can't believe that he'll empower me too. Uh, i got to believe the whole Bible. From Genesis to Revelation. And everything in between. They say, well, that was for the apostles. And the reason that we read about it in Acts. Uh, is because Acts is the Acts of the apostles. Go read Matthew. The last word in Matthew is amen. I talked about this last week. Go read Mark. The last word is amen. Go read Luke and John. The last word is amen. Go read Revelation. The last word is amen. But go to the end of Acts. You will not find that word. Why can't you find amen? Because Acts ain't finished. Acts is still being written. The Acts of the Apostles are still working today. Say, show me scripture. Say, show me scripture. Okay, I'll show you some scripture. The Bible says that we are to continue in the doctrine of the apostles. How can I continue in their doctrine if I ain't got what they got? I got to be empowered. I got to have power on the inside of me. And let me tell you something. Can I get real? Can I get real? If we got to cut this out of the video, so be it. I don't care. But let me tell you something. I don't want to just have power in me, but I can't go to a church that ain't got power in it. I want to go to a church that when I feel like I can't muster up the power within myself, I've got some people around me that will muster up the power for me. Oh. Oh. Yeah. I've got the power. <laughs> I've got the power. Yes, I do. I've got the power inside of me. I hope you've got the power inside of you. And as long as I'm the pastor of House of the Promise, House of the Promise will have power inside of it. I will not compromise the power for feelings or emotions or egos. I will not do it. If God's got a word through somebody else and I need to sit down and be quiet and let them preach, let them preach because the power cannot be compromised. Oh. Oh. We've got this mentality that the show must go on. I say scratch that. The power must go forth. The power's got to go forth because listen to me. I don't want... I don't want Christian people. Can I be honest? I don't want Christian people in here. Do we got Christian people? Lord, I hope so. Y'all shout like Christian folks. <laughs> Are Christian people going to continue to come through that door? You better believe it. And I'm okay with that. I want them to come. But that ain't all I want to come. I want the drug addicts. I want the prostitute. Come on, can I be honest? I want the witch. I want the sorcerer. I want the pagans. I want the liars. 
I want the alcoholics. I want the gossipers. I want them all in this house. But don't get them here if we ain't got the power. Because if we ain't got the power, the addict will leave an addict. The alcoholic will leave an alcoholic. The witch will leave a witch. The pagan will leave a pagan. The sorcerer will leave a sorcerer. But if we've got power, they will walk in sinners. But they will leave saints. They'll come in bound. But they'll leave out of here free. But see, here's the thing. In the Old Testament, God said, I'll send the fire. But it's up to the priest to sustain it. It's up to the priest to sustain it. People come into churches all the time. And they get free. And they leave. And their fire fizzles out. Churches have revival, and an evangelist comes in, brings fire with him, gets the church set on fire, and three weeks later, the church is more dead than it was before the evangelist came. Why? The fire is not being sustained. The fire is not being sustained. We've got the power. That's no question. We've got the power in this house. I've seen cancers healed right before our eyes. Seen breakthrough happen right before our eyes. Monday night we've seen breakthrough happen for you. You see, breakthrough happened for you. Yes. We're still praying for your breakthrough. <laughs> We've seen breakthrough happen. We've seen people get free from emotions. We've seen people get free from alcohol. We've seen people get free from lust and pornography addictions. We've seen it, man. We've seen cancer healed. We've seen it right before our very eyes. We've seen everything as big as cancer be healed. To something as small as a headache to you. We've seen it. So the power is here. The question is, will we sustain it? Will we sustain it? Raise your hand if you was that Monday night prayer. That was test number one. That was test number one. We've got power. That's no question. But when the enemy comes in and tries to make us shut down, are we willing to press? It's like this. When we look at the fire and we see that the flame is getting low, when we take our axes and chop more fuel and put in the work to make sure that the fire doesn't go out. I was in prayer yesterday morning and I was asking God, I was saying, what was that all about last night? Honestly, can I be honest? I haven't told nobody this. I said, what was all that about last night? My goodness, it's like every time we come together, we have revival. In some shape, form, or fashion. Powerful, mighty move of God. And y'all know how it is. When you have a mighty move of God in church, it's not hard to get people to come to church. People that have been going to church for a lot longer than I've been alive. Say, my goodness, for the first time in a long time, I don't have to fight myself to go. I'm ready to go. 
Why? Because the power's there. And that's what we've been experiencing. But Monday night, people had to fight their self to go. And then once they got there, it took everything in us to stay. Because I'm being honest with you. Can I get real? When I went in there and I sat down, I said, my goodness, I'm about to finish my crackers and pepperoni sauces. And I'm going to say, look at the time. You know? Am I the only one? Let me eat my few pieces of crackers and cheese. Drink my little cup. Listen to this Bible study. And get up out of here. What was that? That was the fire being fizzled. It's being dwindled. And it's going down and it's burning low. And we were faced with a decision from that night. Will we let the fire go out? I fully believe if we would have if we would have left Monday night like it was. I may not have been pastor come Sunday. I'm I'm be honest with you. And I, and it wouldn't have been because I would have hung it up and quit. It would probably have been because I wouldn't have had nobody to preach to. <laughs> we was all was I, am I lying? Am I telling a lie? And wonder, how long have you been saved? She's been saved for 38 years. And herself was ready to throw her hands up. Been saved a long time. And they said, I was ready to just go home. I was ready to quit. I was ready to be done. Why? Because the fire was dwindling. And we were faced with a decision. We can either let the fire go out or we can press and we can labor for a while and we can get breakthrough and we can continue on this journey and see people saved and see people set free. Or we can quit. And we press. And we pushed through. And we got there. When I first got saved, I had to do the same thing. I got saved. I stopped doing the things I was doing. I stopped drinking. I stopped talking the way I talked. I stopped living the way I was living. Smoking weed. Selling drugs. I stopped doing it all. I stopped doing it all. But when I would wake up in the morning, I would have to make a decision. Am I going to live today like every other day? Or am I going to live the life that I was intended to live? Every single day. Every single day. And it gets easier every time that I make the right decision. It gets easier to make that decision. And after how many years? 38 years. It's pretty easy to say, I'm not going to go drink. Right? Pretty easy. It's pretty easy to say, I'm not going to tell no lie. Pretty easy. But when your fire starts going out, those decisions that are typically easy get hard. Turn some music on this. I challenged you last Wednesday. I asked everybody, I said, the people that have been baptized in the Holy Ghost, I challenged them to start seeking Holy Spirit like it was the first time. Anybody do that? So guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to challenge you. Seek Him like it is your first time ever seeking Him. You remember when you first met your husband or first met your wife or your boyfriend or your girlfriend? You remember? Aunt Donna's got the wild story. 
She chased her thing. Grabbed him by the nap of his neck and said, Baby, you ain't going nowhere. Why'd she do that? Because she was in love with him. Holy Spirit's no different. See, watch this. What happens after you get married is you stop seeking him. You stop seeking him. You stop chasing after him. Because you got a ring now. I got papers on you. Right? Come on. I stopped seeking her. I stopped working out. I stopped everything. I didn't even care if I looked attractive anymore. She had Lane. Every time I gave Lane a cookie, I got a cookie. Oh, yeah, I like this. Then she had Ellie, and every time I gave them a cookie, I got two cookies. <laughs> now she's got eight. I'm in trouble. Pray for me. We go through a, a bag of Oreos a day. <laughs> I just pray. But we stop seeking them. It's the same thing when we get baptized in the Holy Ghost. A lot of times you get baptized, you get those feelings, you start operating in everything that the Holy Spirit brings, and then you stop seeking them. Stop looking for them. There's a scripture in Colossians, I believe it is, and it tells us that we are to communicate with Holy Spirit daily. We're to commune with Him. You can tell you what that means right there? You know what commune means? To communicate, to talk. I said this in church one time and I thought the preacher was going to run me off. I said, we need to pray to the Holy Ghost. Pulled me into the office. Said, don't ever preach that again. Show me scripture on that. I said, it's right here, brother. It says to commune with the Holy Ghost. He said, that means talk to, not pray. What? What? What is it? Was, was he being sinful? No, he was being ignorant. He was ignorant to the gifts. Oh, you hear what I'm saying? Don't stop seeking the Holy Ghost. If you've never been baptized in the Holy Ghost, you've never spake in tongues, you've never prayed in the Spirit, start seeking Him. Because I believe by the time we get to the end of this thing, we're going to see a manifestation of the Holy Ghost like we never have in our entire life. Why? Because we're not just operating in it. We're operating with understanding. Amen. We're going to talk about praying in tongues next week. I cannot wait. But this is what I want to say. Everybody stand all over the house. This is what I want. This is what I want today. This is what I want today. This is what the Holy Spirit's calling for. If you do not feel like you are on fire for God, this altar call is for you. I want Holy Spirit to come into my life and comfort me and help me and teach me and remind me. I want Him to empower me. I want Him to, to do all those things that we talked about. But the main thing I want Him to do is I want Him to set me on fire. I want to be on fire for God. Amen. Amen. And this is also, this also, if you say, yeah, I'm on fire, but I'm having trouble sustaining, this altar calls for you. Destiny, turn the music up just, just a minute. Think about it. I'm going to give you a few seconds. Start coming when you're ready. Hey guys, I hope today's message has encouraged you and has built your faith because our Bibles tell us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And I pray that we've placed the seed of faith inside of you today. Um, if there's uh, anything that you would like to request prayer for or anything like that, you can always go to our website at houseofthepromisechurch.com. Go to the link that says prayer request and send in any prayer request that you may have. But I want to take just for a few minutes and pray with you guys that the Holy Spirit would just continue to lead you and guide you and direct you and the way that you should go. Dear Heavenly Father, we just pray right now and we ask that any situation, any circumstance that anybody may be facing right now, God, 
God, I pray that you would intervene like only you can, God. I pray that your healing power, God, would go forth and touch them that are sick. Your delivering power would go forth and free them that are in captivity and save those that are lost, God. God, we give you all the praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for watching.